Good morning and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. This is a webinar series, and the topic of today is essential skill for um, <clears throat> academic communication. I am the speaker of today, Khan. I'm also services and Asia training executive from Cambridge University Press. So this is our schedule. <clears throat> we've done uh, three webinars. Um, we've done the introduction. Uh, we talked about how to select an appropriate journal. And uh, we talked about peer review and ethics last month. So today's topic is about essential skills for academic communication. <clears throat> so for you who've already know me, um, this is my introduction. Uh, some of you might join today and might not know me. Uh, I'm working to improve author services in multiple ways and help authors to achieve their professional goals. I have five years of experience training in the consulting in area of OA, and uh, um, I'm focused are uh, focusing on supporting authors to improve their chances at publishing in top tier journals, um, focusing on Asia. And this is my email address. Uh, if you have any questions after the webinar, feel free to email me. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so we're going to talk about two main topics today. The first one is effective science communication. And the second one is scientific presentation. <clears throat> and the first is skill of communication. Um, <clears throat> a new study published today. Uh, okay. A new study published today uh, in Proceeding of National Academic of Science um, from researchers at University of Cambridge and the University of Essex suggested that when it comes to judging scientists, we are more likely to find an attractive scientist interesting, but more likely to consider their less attractive colleagues to be better um, scientists. So we sometimes judge people based on whether they are attractive or not. And researchers also found that people were more interested in learning about work of scientists who were um, physically attractive and who appeared competent and moral. So it seems like very important for us to be attractive or to do an attractive um, presentation or make our communication attractive. So... <clears throat> Why do we want, and this is about like, why do we want to um, engage in science communication? Some benefits are listed here. First, enable informed decision-making. By broadly sharing research results, you will ensure that those making decisions on behalf of others have access to the fact and uh, uh, information that need to act objectively. For example, based on, uh, um, based on up-to-date models and statistics, public health officials could be better uh, positioned to devise effective strategies to handle an emerging disease outbreak in cattle, uh, such as whether to uh, call livestock in certain farming communities. And uh, influence behavior, uh, by broadly sharing your findings, more people can apply what they have um, what they learned from you to um, their own everyday lives. For example, research on plastic biodegradation could encourage people to reduce their plastic consumption um, and increase trust in science. When researchers speak openly about their work, um, uh, this presents a human side to research uh, which in turn helps people trust the information more than if it came from an anonymous source. Increasing trust in science also helps reduce the spread of misinformation 
as we are more likely to share information from source we trust. And the number four, um, generate public support. An effect of increasing, increasing trust in science is an increase in public support for research. This in turn can lead to more political um, support for science and eventually more public funding for research. For this reason, uh, many founders ask us, like ask researchers to share their um, research more broadly. And the final one, inspire the next generation. Um, by being visible to public, researchers can inspire others to consider a career in research, being available to answer questions or demonstrate day-to-day -day life as a researcher can make a research career more accessible to students. So that's the benefits um, of engaging in science communication. And how to um, <clears throat> achieve an effective communication. The first one is understand your audience. So the following list here provides some uh, examples of audience you might discuss. Um, for each audience, we have also um, some examples. Uh, we can talk about the examples. For example, the first one, if the audience are researchers in your field, the situation could be giving a talk at conference. If that's your um, friends and family, um, it could be catching up with them and sharing what you uh, work on. In that case, you might use different languages, different words to describe what you are doing. And if that's journalist, you could be um, giving a media interview about your research. If that's uh, prospective new students, um, you, you might want to handle a wet lab teaching session at a local high school. Um, if that's for um, charity and funders, um, it could be interviewing with a charity board and to request the fundings for the latest project. If that's patients and uh, clinicians, um, <clears throat> well, it could be answering all my questions about the latest results from an ongoing clinical trial. If that's um, like researchers in a different field, um, it could be you to chat to friends or um, in your institution. So different situations uh, you are facing to different audience and different audience, they have different needs. So when you understand your audience and then you try to, you need to identify your audience. <clears throat> your audience might already be defined by the goal you set or you might need to think about best audience you need to reach to achieve your goals. Um, we also, uh, we already have some goals. For example, we want to present to the school. We want to um, attract new students. We uh, want to show our um, results. Depending on our goal, um, we, and then we to identify the audience or reach out to the audience. So your audience, um, is clearly specified in your communication goal. Uh, for example, if your goal is to find new prospective students for your department, your audience will be high school students and your presentation will, um, you might want to use not that technical words and uh, you need to decide which audience will help you to achieve your goals. Um, for example, if your goal is to encourage people to take action based on research findings, you should consider which audience would be um, the best to um, be able to use your communication. In that case, you might consider like policymaker, uh, community groups, or local media. And your audience is dictated by your method of communication. For example, if uh, you might be invited to speak somewhere or do an interview for a magazine, um, in that case, um, there is really a predefined audience in place, such as the audience of the event um, or the readers of the magazine. 
And if you um and you have multiple audience, for example, if your goal is to tell people about your latest research, you might need to share your message multiple times to different audience. Each time you prepare to communicate to a new audience, you should learn a little bit about them. So that's identify your audience. And after you've done that, um, you want to reach, reach your audience. Science communication takes many different forms um, as there are multiple ways to reach your audience. Sometimes you will want to reach many people at once with an article um, in a journal or in a magazine or um, on the website or through an interview on the radio or TV or podcast. Maybe you know exactly where to find your audience online and you can use social media channels to reach them. Or perhaps the best way for you to achieve your goal is by meeting your audience in person to get a talk, um, to demonstrate your work or um, to hold a question and answer session. Um, there are different ways to reach your audience and uh, <clears throat> What works for one type um, of the communication goal isn't necessarily right for another. So the first one could be uh, writing. Um, there are four different uh, types, ways of writing, presenting, uh, using social media or being interviewed. So for the writing, you can write about your research in a publication, um, on the website, in a blog, or for a newsletter targeted to a specific audience. It depends on your goals and your audience. You can explain your research, discuss someone's research, or share an informed opinion. Um, and the second, presenting. You can present in person or through a video connection um, online, or even uh, pre record a uh, pre-record a uh, presentation and post it online to share it more widely that's what we do um sometimes you can see lots of videos on uh, cambridge author hub um it's like um a finished presentation or or a finished video um has been put online and presenting isn't limited to give talks you can demonstrate experiments show equipment and interact directly with your audience. And for example, um, like speaking about your research at a science festival, that's um, a, a kind of one form of presenting. And number three, the social media. If your audience is on social media, you can directly interact with them and share what you are working on. Um, you can also answer their questions and find out what they want to know more about. For example, um, you can see the discussion group on Facebook or on the research gate. Um, and some researchers even post their new articles on LinkedIn um, like this. And uh, the num number four, being interviewed. You might be interviewed by a journalist who is writing an article or by a presenter of TV or radio program or podcast. Because you are the scientist, you are um, the researcher. You might also be interviewed by your institute's press office. And there are also other ways to reach out audience outside of science. Um, <clears throat> for example, you can consult on a communicate project um, have conversation with friends and family or collaborate with artists on a science-themed performance or exhibition. Um, <clears throat> often these projects still involve writing and speaking about science in some way. Um, and uh, you need to correctly match audience goals and your methods. Um, <clears throat> For example, if you want to highlight your latest research to researchers in other fields, you can write a blog post for a relevant scientific organization. So reach your audience, the point is correctly match audience goals and methods. So this is like a very general 
um, some skills and tips for uh, how to effectively communicate with your audience. And then <clears throat> let's have a look at uh, the second part, um, giving an effective presentation. So um, although presenting is a frequent task for most of, of us, many of us only receive minimal training in presenting and uh, instead uh, expect to pick up skills as we go along. The problem is that uh, presenting research is very different from doing research. So it's not surprising that many of us can struggle with a task. So the good presenting um, skills or good presentations advance our career. Most of, us at this, most of us at some point have found ourselves listening to a rather unengaging talk while it felt as um, though the presenter had just uh, assembled some pretty exciting, uh, pre, um, pre-existing slides or um, decided to run through a list of experiments without any clear purpose. So great presentations can markedly drive your research career, improve your reputation within the scientific community and help advance your research. By contrast, giving um, mediocre talks might mean missing out on opportunities. And this um, difference applies to researchers at all career stage. So here are some uh, advances uh, I've listed here. So we've talked about um, good presentation advance our career, then what makes a good talk? So at first glance, the quality that make, an, <clears throat> make a scientific talk great or hard to paint down, um, similar to those relating to um, music or painting or other human activities. Understanding the quality of great speaker history is one thing, but likely most of seminar or conference do not involve stirring speeches. Um, However, a little reflection after hearing a very good or very excellent uh, scientific presentation is due to very specific qual um, qualities of the speaker. So the point is us as a speaker, the first thing is confidence. So conveying to the audience that the speaker knows what they, what we are talking about while um, hiding any signs of nervousness. Secondly, um, the style of the speaker is often um, converse, uh, conversational, the very opposite of speechifying. Um, this means that however big the audience, each member is made to feel that the speaker is communicating to them along. Like uh, if, if I'm a good speaker, you will feel like I am talking to you, only you. This is very much like, um, the fireside chat of U.S. President, you know, Franklin D. Uh, Roosevelt, in which he managed to achieve a personal touch despite addressing millions of radio listeners. So that is a great talk. And uh, before getting into details about presentation of talk itself, we must stress the need to keep it within a defined lim a time limit. Um, you can find this table very useful and you can you might find this table in many books or um, online forms. <clears throat> we can define slides as units of visual material displayed to your audience. And this will be mainly digital slides uh, created using like PowerPoint, but there will be a circumstance when we're a chalkboard, flip chat, or overhead projector will be used instead. In this case, it's the time taken to draw on the board or chat will slow um, the talk down compared with when digital slides are used. Um, determining the maximum number of slides that can be comfortably delivered within the allotted time 
this table gave a rough guide for this tank to type of presentation based on an average slide rate of slightly less than one per minute. So if that's conference or workshop session, like duration is maybe like 10 minutes, time for questions could be five minutes. Then the suggested working number of slides is seven to uh, seven to nine. So each slide you might spend like one minute, around one minute, you got 10 minutes for duration, uh, uh, five minutes for dura duration, uh, five minutes for the questions. <clears throat> And the, um, the figure that does not um, have to be adhered to exactly, some slides can be lingered over for most of the talk. So the actual number used might be very slow. Um, alternatively, filter slides may be used to break the talk into logical section and uh, may last for much less than a minute. So the final number may um, even exceed uh, the, the maximum quoted. So the thing is, you, you can calculate based on your slides, but I personally think you could rehearse before your talk and then you know how, many, how much time you might need um, for the whole presentation. So this is a time and this is very important and how to plan our talks? Um, first, turning your material into a story. So a dry recitation of facts does not make a good talk. Science, uh, since science deals with facts, there is a real danger that presenter will fall into this trap. Um, it also occurs in areas outside uh, science, including tourism. Um, I think some of some of us have been bored by a poorly trained guide who just lists the dates and places without any contacts or human interest. And you're going to feel like really boring. Um, go with that tour guide. And this is why crafting talk into a story is of fundamental importance. We don't expect to, we could talk um, like a fiction, but the story format could convey the key message in a way that human beings can absorb. If we do not think in that way from the outset, the resulting talk can be um, formulaic and boring. And there's a way to enhance a presentation, um, which is to draw upon relevant historical allusions or a site that might um, help you to put your work in context or just provide a bit of general interest to try to attract to normal people. In a second, the elevator page. Um, could you identify the essential meaning of your work and convey it uh, uh, succinct um, in the time it takes for an, like for three minutes, we call that for an elevator to travel a few floors. Um, this is an elevator page here page that is now so um, prevalent in management training and the related activities. Um, if, with regardless of how the term orang, uh, originated, and there are several accounts online, the concept is very useful, particularly, particularly so for uh, planning a longer formal presentation. As far as I know, some universities ask their PhD students to do the three minutes presentation about their thesis. That's a quite similar uh, practice. And acknowledgement in the collaborative world of scientific research, it's very rare uh, for a speaker to have nobody to acknowledge. So colleagues um, should be thanked during the talk um, this seems to occur most uh, commonly at the end after the conclusion side. Um, ha and, but but also you can um, you you can try um, placing acknowledgement at the beginning of the talk. It's also okay. And number four, handling multiple themes. Um, a short conference 
conference presentation is not um, long enough to cover more than one thing. So the path for questions to conclusion is a liner and a continuous one. A longer seminar or um, keynote speech um, is a different matter. The speaker, we may still have a single key message, but this time it can be reached by a number of parties using data that have been generated by a number of collaborators. There may also be more than one group of conclusions, so the most punches should be laughing for the end. Uh, <clears throat> the challenge with this type of presentation is to keep the key message in focus without um, excessive side tracking or um, styling. The basic principle of storytelling must still be adhered to um, but this time with aided subplots and natural breaks. Even if the audience is handing on your um, every word during a seminar or longer talk, um, they will respond to a series of break in the follow of information. This can be brief summarized of what has been delivered already or uh, visual cues to introduce the next thing. Mm, there is definitely a place for appropriate humor as well, um, a device that is used in many um, thr thrillers to break the ice. And uh, structuring the talk. So this is also part of planning the talk. The basic structure of the talk needs um, boundaries so that you can guide the audience in whatever direction you want the route and the uh, um, destination must uh, be planned carefully. Otherwise, the audience will be lose, um, will, will be lost, and talk will be failure. Once you have defined um, the limits of the talk and uh, articulate the key message, next step, uh, next stage involves establishing a logical sequence. There seems to be a good um, uh, consensus among writers uh, on scientific presentation about just what the logic sequence could be. So um, this is a structure we would like to suggest you to use. First part, why you did this work. Um, that's pretty much about the introduction um, in the presentation part. And the second, how you did it um, equals to the methods and what you found um, results and what you think it means, summary and uh, conclusion. So um, the figure on the left, the, rel the relative uh, proportion of the talk uh, that should be devoted to each of the section is summarized in the figure. So this is planning uh, the talk. And we talk about the narrative structure. So the narrative structure provides a, a scaffold in which you can insert your findings to arrange them in logical sequence. <clears throat> uh, organizing your findings into this kind of cause and effect relationship helps you, um, your audience engage with your talk in these two ways. Uh, first, clarify your line um, of thought and the key message. Story structure um, help your audience to follow the line of thought that can lead you to your key message. If you don't create a logical link, your audience might draw their um, own conclusion from your data. Ideally, these conclusions uh, <clears throat> would match yours um, or add a new interesting angle that you haven't considered yet. But in reality, however, it is possible that your audience misinterprets your results, given that they probably haven't thought about them for as long as you have and might not have looked at all information you considered. And the second, building and maintaining tension Story structure also help you to build and maintain tension during your pre 
during your presentation. Um, compelling stories uh, constantly rise and uh, answer questions in the audience mind, leaving them to wonder and then what uh, until you reach your conclusion at the end. Um, that's a two thing. I use a narrative structure. And when you've done um, the thoughts, when you uh, know your audience, identify them and choose a way when you present, you plan the talk. Oh, you've done everything. And the next step is set up your slide, uh, slide deck. So choose your presentation software. Normally we use present, uh, we use uh, PowerPoint and I am using PowerPoint um, too. It's part of the Microsoft Office uh, program. And someone might use Keynote too. Keynote is Apple's native presentation software. Um, and some of us might use Google Slides. And Google Slides is a browser-based app that is freely available within Google. So it doesn't matter which platform, which software you're gonna use. Um, the next step is to choose a suitable template. So for example, we working for Cambridge, we have official um, kind of templates to use. So we don't have to choose template. If your university or your institution has your um, branding, your official, um slides template you can just use that if your students and your um school doesn't have that just use um based on your audience based on the situation choose a suitable one um to use uh and then setting up your slide deck uh make it a logically story and the next slide is some resources um, I've put the PowerPoint tutorial, Keynote, Google Slides links here. And also um, <clears throat> because I referenced the book published by Cambridge, the presentation skill for science scientists, um, a practical guide. And this is a link. Um, if you are, I think most of you are customers for Cambridge and your university must have purchased the book, you can just your, use the institutional login try and to log to log into the website, the Cambridge core, and then you can get that book freely online. And this is a conference checklist uh, also from that book. Um, the following checklist contains key points for a last minute check over. Um, I think this is quite useful for you if you're going to go to the conference. I think after COVID, we, 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 we might need to go to lots of conference on site, and this could be really useful for you. Um, and thank you for coming to today's webinar. Uh, this is the end. If you have any questions, please feel free to uh, tap your question to the Q&A box. And this is a survey, uh, feedback survey, if you have time. Um, please scan the QR code and uh, complete the survey. Let us know your um, suggestions. Yeah. Thank you very much. And this is our schedule for uh, the schedule for the next time. Uh, next topic will be enhance the international impact of your research. We're going to talk, uh, talk about how to promote um, your article, uh, your published manuscripts. Uh, what are some of the big difference in academic presentation, business presentation, PhD first year, economy straightforward? Well, 
the academic presentation is more like um you're you're going to talk about research topics, your field, your experiment to everything about your um research. But a business presentation is more about like you are part of the business process or you're part about uh you're part about uh, about about the increasing or interest to process so we're talking about that uh the focus might not be on your research or your experiment but on the benefits of your research and uh, what kind of benefits could you to bring to uh, this business uh model that's the main point main difference this show the QR code again a QR code here. And what are the common traits to let the audience attend to your our talk or presentation for the whole time? Um I have some tips personally. Um normally we don't have like too long uh presentation like longer than 40 minutes. Normally, we would suggest for people to have 20 minutes to 30 minutes. I think even 15 minutes is the best. 20 minutes is the best. So people can concentrate on things. Doesn't matter what kind of things, people can concentrate on that in the first 10 minutes. And then we kind of start to, um, like our brain is kind, kind of hiding out and it's not here and start to think about things, can't really concentrate. So for the speaker, you need to um, adjust that atmosphere. Like we are talking about key things. Um, it just emphasizes tongues. That's the first thing. And uh, you don't want to put <clears throat> things that audience need to think together to separate them. Uh, for example, at the first three minutes, it's a really introduction. Um, it's a really like background and people gradually uh, feeling like they are get, getting there. And then you start to talk about something important. And then the break deck, the break slide, you give people some time to have a small break. You're talking about that, but that's not important. And people can kind of rest, their brain can have a rest. And then you start to talk about main things um, and people can start to think again. And also like what we talked in the slides, you sometimes could talk about some humor things, some uh, general things with human interest. Um, some examples can also make people to concentrate from the beginning to the end. And also the storytelling method if you're talking about things like you're talking about story, um, people might not want to leave. They want to listen to the results. Like everyone's like this. We want to know the results. We know the message you've done. We know everything. And we just want to know the results. And then they're going to leave. They're going to stay to the end. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do you have any software or website to do brainstorming for your talk or seminar? Um, no, I don't. <laughs> um, I already hand drafting. I already write by hand, handwriting or hand drawing. It's really like hand drafting. I, I think just personally thing, I pray for handwriting. And how bad it is if a speaker cannot finish presentation? Um, um, time would do what to do over the time has run out. So it depends on what kind of uh situation. If that's some like casual presentation, you might still have time to finish that. Uh, if that's pretty straight, um, like uh, next to the new year um bell gonna ring and uh, you don't have enough time, then they might stop you. So, uh, and also a really long um, presentation 
want to attract people. So the three minutes train three three minutes presentation training um is trying to let us to practice um to express our core idea uh with some support with logical um thoughts in a really short time. Uh time is just a trick, three minutes introduction uh, at clients, then to main things with human interest. We can raise out that story, adjusting atmosphere. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Dependent on, yes. <laughs> kind of personal uh, experience. Yeah, about the time, it's it, it really depends on the situation. If that's just Carol, I think that's fine. But I think mostly when we are going to the conference, the time could be really strict because the arrangement is like... A, really tight, the schedule is tight. So we'd better finish our presentation on time. Um, how can academic communication strategy be effectively uh, followed to accommodate US audience with random levels of ex... Oh, wow. Um, Well, it's a good question by uh Giovanni. Well, yeah, it's it, it's it's difficult if your audience are diverse, uh ver very fine levels of experiment and knowledge in a specific field. Yeah, it's it's not like you you put um undergraduate students, PhD students, and also some really experienced uh, <coughs> audience there. And in that case, you might start to think which part of audience is your main audience. You cannot um, use a single presentation to satisfy all different groups. It's pretty difficult. So you need to think like what we talked to identify the audience, which group is your target group. And if you cannot, there is another way. It's like um, for the entry level, you talk about this. Um, <clears throat> so we sometimes have that situation. We talk to librarians, we talk to students, and we talk to um, researchers, professors at the same uh, presentation. Sometimes there is a thing um, and uh, they are in the same level, but for th some things they are totally in different levels. And then we could uh, make different parts, like the first section, uh, I'm talking to the laborants, and the second section, um, I'm talking to entry-level researchers. And the third one, this is for the um, really high-level professors, um, you can do this, but yeah, this is not a really easy one, I think. It's, it's very difficult and because you need make sure that the audience won't lose lose concentration during you are talking when you are talking about part other people's part and uh, the thank you can request it to have the mini half minutes of this meeting oh minutes um Uh, uh, it's 40. So my preparation for this webinar um, of this meeting, do you mean the webinar? I'm sorry. Um, summary, please. Thank you. Uh, what kind of summary do you want? Like a, a summary about this webinar? And do too much. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we've talked about the two main things. Um, the first is about the like general thing about 
effective science communication. Uh, we talk about uh, uh, the benefits of engaging in science communication because not every researcher want to share um, their results, their um, research. Um, and then if you want to share, you should first understand your audience and then identify your audience and reach to your audience. And in that, in this part, you need to make sure correctly match audience goals and methods. And the second part, we talked about giving an effective presentation, which is a part, um, one way to reach your audience. And we are giving an effective presentation. Um, you need to know good presentation advance your career. So that's very important. And you need to know a good talk is mainly rely on the uh, speaker itself, first the confidence, and then uh, conversa conversational. And uh, then you need to know how to plan the talk, turning your material to a story, the outreach page, the three minutes practice, practice the acknowledgement, and handling multiple things, natural breaks, that's tips. Um, and structuring the talk, um, use a narrative structure, structuring the talk. And in the end, you set up your slide deck, use your software, choose your suitable templates. Uh, if you're going to go to the conference, you, you could check the checklist um, before you go and make sure everything is all ready. Uh, so the recording is shared on YouTube. When you receive the, uh, we're gonna send the recording again to you. When you receive that, you can find the uh, YouTube account. And then on that account, you can see the previous two seminars video. <clears throat> Um, thank you very much. So, um, uh, yeah, we, I'm going to see you all next month. Uh, so the next month is, uh, enhance the international impact of your research and we will share the PDF, uh, the video to you and, uh, just to wait for our emails. Thank you very much and uh, have a good day. See you next month.